Hey everyone, welcome to Uncle Smithy, episode 3. And uh, this series, which I appreciate is extremely niche, is me going through Kind Words, Low Five Boots to Chill To, and answering some of the questions in a bit more longer format. Um, probably because I feel like there's lots of like milestone moments going on in the world at the moment. Um, so I'm recording this just before the new year of 2021. It's been a crazy year in 2020, depending on how many years in advance you might have somehow stumbled across this. And um, I get the feeling that people might have lots of um, thoughts and feelings about how the new year will be. And so I'm going to try and see if there's any letters out there that might kind of talk to that. Or think about like ways of tackling new year, new me and all of that kind of stuff. Um, because you don't need to wait till January to change something. So let's get going. Okay, so the first one I think is quite true for people that study, uh, but also people that get kind of, uh, not fear of failure, but almost like fear of success, like the flip opposite of it. I have the bad habit of hiding in from my work in my studies. I'm so focused on the idea that I'm going to fail that I do everything I can to not think or do anything about it. Even break time isn't real because I feel guilty because of it. Any advice to get over this? <clears throat> so I kind of have the opposite effect where I get so lost in things, I forget about the rest of the world around me. Um, whereas my other half struggles with this exact same thing where they get um, what I call analysis paralysis, where you've either got too many ideas that conflict or there's things that you kind of go, oh, I should do. And then um, my partner spends so long planning everything, love a post-it note, love a board, love a chart, but they spend so long in the planning phrase, uh, phase rather, that the actual then doing becomes so truncated that you've almost planned yourself into failure because you've spent so long in that initial phase of doing stuff. Um, one of the first things that I think that I'd recommend out of all of this is to try and get into the habit of when you do go for a break is to utterly pull yourself away from whatever you're doing. If that's work, studies, a hobby that's kind of become a work and you need to kind of properly disconnect yourself. This is something that I've really had to learn working from home throughout the whole of 2020. Um, I used to work in an office, my work involved quite a lot of travel around the country, um, which I don't miss in any way, shape or form. But what I found is that I live basically in this room <laughs> uh, and have done throughout the whole of 2020. And so when I shut off my work laptop, initially, all I was just doing was like moving it to the next to the sofa. And then I'd be like, mm, I could just do blah, blah or I'd, it would kind of be in the background of my mind. And I found that my um, switching off is so much better because I'm taking that laptop and now I actually I take it out into a completely different room and I put it away and I'm like, no, no, no. And it's that pure disconnection from it that then helps me kind of have a brain refresh. And then that break time feels like a break time because I'm really physically pulling myself away. And then I don't feel guilty about seeing something on the side, even not finished or not done, because I know that my work time is over and therefore I'm now in my like recoup recovery. Because if you spread yourself so thin or if you're constantly not feeling like you disconnect, then when you come back, you've not refilled your battery and your energy to then plow back into that work again. So that's my main tip for this one. I think around uh, focusing on the plan to fail uh, or focusing on failing that you don't then do anything. Chunking is my main takeaway from this. In that when, if you do get into planning, and I strongly recommend that you do, but do it in a manageable way, so that there's always things that you can kind of tick off or cross off or rub off a, a um, like a whiteboard or something like that, where they're manageable pieces. And it might be that you've got like, must do assignment and then you'll need to break it down into small chunkable sections that you can then do either in a day or a week depending on how long your project is so that you see that progress going across because whilst that might mean that you need to invest some initial time to get that going it's super helpful to then see that you're making progress 
and therefore you're taking steps towards success rather than feeling like something is too great and therefore it feels overwhelming because you don't know where to start and then you fail and i the reason why i've chosen this one to kind of do in this whole like 2020 new me stuff is that i think a lot of people when um eventually covid is over or better um and we start being like oh i'm going to take on blah and blah and blah chunk it because otherwise you're gonna collapse into a ball of catastrophe because you won't have planned stuff out managed your expectations and your kind of load if that makes sense um I strongly recommend that to anyone that takes on any kind of new hobbies or stuff like that so that you can kind of work up and to a level and maintain that going forward. This absolutely applies to studies. Depending on how you work, you can just get away with just sticking some post-it notes on a wall, um, but make sure it's not in like a recreational space. It's a place that you dedicate to sitting down and study. If you have any kind of inkling of doing it digitally, I strongly recommend Trello as a really easy way to kind of dip your toe into some kind of simplistic project management. Um, and if you really love project management and you're going for free, I'd recommend Asana, uh, A-S-A-N-A. -A. Um, I use that to kind of keep track of all the multiple projects that I do personally myself. Um, I do think that's probably a bit overkill if you're just going on studies, but something like with Trello, because you can just type in like a random sentence and then you can like scrub it off and be like done and it's digital and therefore you can kind of clean your mind of it so hope that was helpful um i do quite a lot of project management -y types of stuff as part of my day job so um i have lots of things and thoughts to say about stuff like that <laughs> sorry okay so this is what i've written written wrote yeah uh, break time never felt like a break working from home, so I pack all my work stuff away so that I can totally disconnect. That's really helped me. For the fear of failure, or success as it may be, because I think you can get caught in both traps, I recommend doing a small plan of parts of your study so that you can tick stuff off as you, so that you can see the progress. Make it into chunks of work so that it's not a huge job to manage, but chunky enough to see progress over time. It really helps make a big project seem less overwhelming. Come on, little Mr. Deer. Post your way. Okay, this next one is on a relatively similar theme, and it reminds me very much of the whole New Year, New Me um, ethos, uh, even though this is a much more overarching kind of question. Um, this person says, I've been trying to reach a dream job for over 10 years. The closer I get, the further away it gets, as if I'm not meant to reach it. I'm worried I wasted all these years to reach something that I'm not capable of. When is it time for me to give up? I'm scared of changes. So there's several things that I want to say, and this is going to be a really long answer, and I'm sorry. And I've I've tried to say this once already, and I just went on and I was like, delete, you'll have to be more succinct. So depending on your dream job, and this doesn't need to be a job, this could just be a dream of where you want your future life to be. You will have a triangle of dream, reality, expectation and if you've got something that's a huge dream over here and that's because you need to be at the real top of your field and it's really difficult to attain and you might need loads of qualifications and experience and you might need a whole career path or it could be that you have real high expectations of what you want in a certain field so your dream could be that you want to be a youtuber well i've just done that dream but i've only got seven thousand subscribers just under in like 12 years. So if my expectation was I'm gonna have a million, then uh -ohs, my triangle doesn't quite work. But if my dream is to just be on YouTube, but I have low expectations of it, then that reality is kind of more pulled in. So where you kind of sit on that triangle is gonna really determine then how you need to set up your life. Because if you've got a really small angular piece of the pie in that triangle, you're going to need to make so many sacrifices. You're going to need to orientate your life around how do you put yourself in the best possible place to get that dream. Uh, job, family, home, um, career path, lifestyle, whatever it is you want to brand as your dream. You need to focus all of your day, all of your week, 
into making sure that you can get there and make that attainable so that you're in the best possible place whenever that opportunity arises. You then need to understand what you can control and what you can't control. You can control your application to a job. You can control the follow-up. You can control the content of your applications, be that a showreel, a CV, or anything like that whatsoever. You can't control the quality of everyone else's applicants of what's going on around. You can only be the best version of yourself. So you can't be freaking out that someone else who may have more experience is doing the same application as you because you can't control that. So you need to spend your energy focusing that on yourself. The thing that kind of calls out to me with this as well is that you need to be, you need to have an element of love of the chase of that dream and also understanding that you'll need to have stepping step stepping blocks or stepping stones to get to that path where the dream job is like ah, at the end of it and if you can't love that or you can't justify the means even if you never get to that dream job that's again about that whole triangle where you might need to lower your expectations so that you feel happier and there's nothing wrong with that because once you've then reached that limit um, let me think of an example. If, say, you wanted to open a dog sanctuary, um, this is something my Raf bangs on about a lot. He's like, I want to go from dog sanctuary so we can just have dogs everywhere. And I was like, mm. um, <laughs> love doggos, don't want millions of them. Wouldn't be able to cope with millions of them. But if that was your, like, your goal, um, it's a simple one to kind of go for. Is looking after just having dogs as pets enough of your expectations to say that you're making a difference? If not, do you then want to volunteer in dog homes? If not, do you then want to focus in on rescue animals so that you can then rehabilitate them and start training them? Do you then want to get some kind of um, qualification in dog training and behavioural science with pets and things like that? Do you then want to sponsor or become multi-business partners with a small um i don't know pet holiday place where people put their animals when they go on holiday so that you can look after them like kennels how feasible is that do you want to have a track record of people that you've then say dog walked beforehand um i'm spitballing to just try and kind of get things out of the idea but can you see that they're all stepping stones to get towards something you can't just go in at the top tier it is so rare that that can happen and I think you're setting yourself up for failure if you do ever go down that route of thinking that that will happen because you need to have that track record to show that you are capable of working at the top tier of your dream job. Now obviously if your dream job is I want to be self-employed and do my own thing then it's more that's much more obtainable in that reality versus um, dream kind of window but you might need to lower your expectations to begin with as a startup, getting some new cl customers in, your first clients or something like that. And be aware that you're going to need to put in the groundwork for such a tiny piece of reward. And that's the, the reason why I say when is it time or ask the question, when is it time for me to give up? It's when all of that work to get the tiniest of reward is no longer enough or fulfilling for you. That is when it's time to give up because if you can if you're forever chasing and you know that you won't get there or you know that you may not get to the next tier of your progression if it's not enough for you to just continue doing what you're doing now then it's time for you to give up or scale back or reevaluate actually what is your dream and does that still incorporate what you've done so far and you can pivot and kind of go somewhere else. For me, um, one of my dreams is to be a completely independent creator and kind of like media outlet, um, which is why the Higher Plane Network is a thing. But I have very, because it's something that I know I can't like obtain overnight, I'm being super snail-like and methodical in the way how I go about it, building up platforms both on websites and on YouTube, um, launching a variety of different media to kind of see what works, what doesn't. Um, but then in doing that, also finding what works for me as a creator and trying to find where like the Venn diagram fits in the middle, at least as a starter. 
Um, I have very low expectations because I don't have um, absolute massive outgoings. But if I was to then start to see a rampant rise in something, maybe that would change my expectations and maybe then change what my next steps of my plan are to try and then redefine maybe what my dream is as being an independent creator. So um, like long term, I'd love to have my own platform where I didn't need to rely on YouTube, for example. Um, I'm not going to have that and have that self-sufficient on um, my six or seven wonderful patrons, but it's still six or seven patrons. Um, the money does not quite compute. Um, so it'll be a long way off, but we're working towards getting there. And I love the, the chase of it, so to speak, because it keeps me engaged and creative. Um, and it's the main thing that I do. I finish, I've got my work, my other half, and all of my projects, and that is my life. And everything is set up around so that I get lost in the creative flow of everything, be that music, games, film, um, and other like creative outputs that I do uh, hidden around the internet and so on. And um, I wouldn't have it any other way. And if no one comes to watch, I don't mind. And that's where that whole triangle comes back in. So do a triangle, see where it ends up, and then evaluate where your life is and whether or not it matches. Because if it doesn't, something needs to change, either your dream, your expectations, or your life to fit in with where you want that to go. Um, I'm scared of changes. Sadly, if you're gonna go for something that is your dream, you may need to get creative with some changes to make that happen. And perhaps that's more about um, you need to kind of seriously think about whether or not changes have been put in front of you that would mean that your dream job comes about, but you weren't prepared to make those changes for the dream job. So therefore, have you really chased everything with it? Open question. And it's something to always think about. Um, I know uh, 2011, 2012, I didn't believe in I didn't believe that something was going to happen and so I closed off some very important doors that could have made something very different happen in my life where I could have been in um more oh, how do I say it more um prominent media circles dare I say um, because I just didn't believe it to be true and maybe if I had believed it of true I'd be a very different place in my life today um, so I think being open to opportunities and being able to embrace change um, and be resilient of change is a huge, huge advantage. And if there's anything that you can do to kind of help you do that, even if that's incrementally, I think that would be great. So, yeah, what a ramble. Sorry, that was a long one. <laughs> Let's see what I write. OK, I'm not quite sure I've, I've explained how I feel in 14 lines, but we've given it a go. If you aren't loving the chase or enjoying any incremental gains towards your dream and any sacrifices don't seem to justify the means, then it's time to give up. Before you do, make sure your expectations, stepping stones and dream verse reality are in check though. Is this something at a lower, is, is doing something at a lower tier but in the industry okay for now? I.e. I want to be a radio presenter cool can you get in on the sound design first um have you closed off opportunities because of the fear of change by being blinkered um Darren brown does a really interesting documentary around this um i'm sure it's online free on youtube somewhere he puts most of his stuff on there where uh, people who are quite pessimistic and closed off uh, to other people don't spot opportunities and they were putting 50 pound notes down on the ground in front of people and uh, like winning lottery tickets and stuff like that. And people were just walking straight past it because they um, didn't think anything, they, they thought they were unlucky. And so they weren't making their own luck kind of thing. And I think you could kind of get into a cycle with this type of thing. Anyway, if you want it, continue to put yourself in every shop front to be seen. You can only control what you control, not the full end result. hope that makes sense poor person good luck <laughs> okay this one's quite a chonky one uh, and quite heavy but 
it's really interesting because the way how I was thinking about the previous letter, this one was too further on. The other two were about social anxiety, which I didn't want to want to dive into because it didn't feel like a new year, new me type thing. Whereas this one could kind of fit into that category for a lot of people. I'm overshadowed by the thought that a few years ago I had my chance to shine in personal life and career and I sabotaged it. And now that it's lost forever. 30 years old and I have no motivation to start over. I stay home, eat unhealthy and living is a burden. Now firstly, I'm really sorry to hear to this person that they feel like living is a burden. Um, I think uh, particularly around this time as well, a lot of things are extra strained um, and a lot of people are feeling like living is a burden or living is a monotonous chore. Um, and I hope that you'll be able to kind of kickstart something um, into your life again, whatever that may be. Um, it starts with one change. Um, I don't mean to be like that, you can do it, kind of like pom-poms out, cringe fest. But the main reason why I wanted to kind of dive into this question, uh, and it's never been more um, prevalent, I think now, um, is that I speak to so many people who um, are in their 30s and sometimes in their mid 20s and they feel like their life is already over and that's heartbreaking um in my day job uh, about six seven years ago i used to work with people who uh, were on low incomes trying to help them kind of um either into training or employment or structure some like where they wanted their life to be uh, in the future. And it would be kind of, although it would be much more employment focused, it would be, it was much more holistic than that because quite often you'd need to kind of tackle a variety of different issues to kind of help people along their way. And the common theme was that people felt like as soon as you miss out on a gravy train or make a misstep or a mistake or something doesn't flow seamlessly, it's as if you fall out of the societal cog and it feels like you can't get back into it again. It's not the case. I can absolutely see why it would feel like that. But I think now more than ever, with a huge reset, um, and I hate to bring up COVID again, but COVID is disrupting so many people's lives um, that if you have had an opportunity and it's gone horribly wrong or you've misstepped somewhere or you didn't pick up on an opportunity and things have kind of stalled since millions 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 of lives are stalling right now and there is less and less stigma attached to it because um in the uk for example i think it's um about 70 percent or 80 percent of the uk are one paycheck away from being in poverty and being evicted from like their home or uh, falling behind on uh, mortgage payments and stuff like that because you live to your means of the means that you expect without having like something smashing in and ruining your life. But also lots of us are kind of struggling as well. Um, and so that's not right. It's absolutely not right. And the divide seems to be getting ever greater between the richer and the poorer and so on and so forth. But this isn't the time for me to be like, Rah! Um, for everyone. But what it does mean is that um, I've personally noticed this over, especially over the last 12 months, but over the last two to three years, there's been a real change in the fact that it's no longer a job for life. It's no longer um, being able to stay in one place for life anymore. It's as if our world is now so chaotic that you're expected to have six or seven jobs. 
you might train for something and be ready and primed for something and then find out that industry doesn't really exist or need that anymore. Automation is a huge thing that is causing lots and lots of issues in various different markets. Same with online versus in person, like retail, for example. And whilst you see places kind of collapse and plummet, other opportunities start to arise. And they may only be kind of temporary fixes for a set period of time before that then may crumble and move on and then something else will pop up. And it's that technology in the pursuit of the future is a wonderful thing in many, many respects, but it does lead to societal disruption. Um, and with that comes the chaos emotionally, financially, well, uh, mentally, with everything that comes along. So what I wanted to kind of say out of all of this is at no age is your personal or professional life lost forever. Never, 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 never. It might mean that you may have to get creative. It might mean that you need to um, branch out into new fields. It might mean that you may need to retrain into something. It might mean that you need to put yourself out in a different light. And it may lead to some difficult conversations depending on how you've sabotaged your life. And that's very subjective. It might You might not have sabotaged anything at all. It might not have been your fault at all. But if say, let me think. If say you lost your family and you lost your job through addiction, for example. That is something that will carry with you for the rest of your life. But the way how you can turn that into a narrative that means that you carry it with you and it is part of you because it's part of yourself, but it then also becomes a platform of strength to say, do you know what, I've got past that I have overcome that or I've acknowledged that and I'm dealing with that and I'm starting on my journey towards it. Who wants to be part of it because I'm wanting to change? The key there is the want to change if you're right at the very beginning of this cycle and if living feels like a burden, that small spark to changing is going to be really, really tiny baby steps. Um, and some days will be okay and some days will absolutely not and the knowledge of riding through those days of not being okay to know that a day where you will be is coming will be rough and it'll be shit but it will come and it's having that faith and confidence in yourself that that will come will kind of help you ride out that storm and then Eating unhealthily maybe not helps, but it's interesting that it's you stayed home, you ate unhealthily. Why is that your main, like your second thing in the loop? What can that, what can you do to do one change with that? And I know I'm post Christmas, so I'm extra chonky, but. What could you do one day a week where you eat something slightly different and then how does that make you feel if that's if that's the key to unlocking it and i'm not saying it is stay at home what could you do if you're comfortable staying at home that means that you can flick a switch can you interact with people online do you want to join a forum or a group on facebook or something like that where you can talk about a hobby that you have or an interest that you have um, the comfort of strangers online is a wonderful thing and I will not have anything bad said against it um, it's that little spark that will get you going and then you'll be able to go in and then you take you make that part of your narrative and your story which is really posh for saying that when you turn up and you feel confident enough to start engaging in having a personal or professional life again um, you can wear your scars as a badge of honour to say, I fucking made it. I hope that makes sense. Let's see what I write. 
Okay. So, I've popped, I work with people of all ages to help them kickstart their lives after something has gone wrong, and I can hand on heart say no one is lost forever. It may mean that you might have to take the tiniest of steps forward to make positive changes, such as joining online groups, pop out for a walk, have one day a week with some greens. Oh! <laughs> for those small changes will slowly start to ripple out. Remember that living won't always be a burden every day, and I hope you can ride the storm for clearer skies ahead. Um, as always, with kind words, there is lots of mental health resources in the menus and stuff like that. Sometimes you do get some really heavy stuff on here. Um, it's all anonymous because you just get the M at the end, or the, if I was on there, it'd be an S or something like that. Um, don't feel like you have to reply back to things where things feel quite there's a veil of depression and suicidal thoughts in there potentially um so when you do go and get into this just be really careful with how you word stuff back um i have to say with this game i've never seen a um terrible reply or an uncaring reply is probably the best way to phrase that um We'll see, we'll see. So yeah, that's that. Here's a tangent one, and a bit more upbeat and uplifting. Have you met a good friend on a video game? How did it happen? How are you guys now? Yes. Um, so the vast majority of my friends I've met through online gaming, and uh, it was mostly, mostly through sim racing. Um, so, there was a game back in the mid 2000s called R Factor, uh, and R Factor 2 is its current version. Uh, and it was kind of like a sandbox racing game, but it was highly moddable, so everyone would be able to make tracks, uh, make cars, and then make liveries. And that led itself to being really league friendly. So, um, I joined up with some leagues, drive around, usually at the very back of the field because I'd be driving with a keyboard or a controller and everyone's like got wheels and cockpits and it's, that's why it's like sim racing because it's like ultimate experience and there's me trying to like ham fist it with like a controller um, hence three, four seconds off the pace. But um, in doing that and in doing the broadcasts for commentary and all of that kind of stuff, I met an amazing group of people. Um, a couple of hundred people, to be fair. Uh, in general, although all passionate and tempers would obviously flare on the track and off it, um, a lovely, bu lovely bunch of lads. Uh, and there's like a core, like 12, 15 of them that I've then kept in really, really close contact with and are some of my best friends that I have. So yeah, absolutely fab. We all stay in contact. Um, even if we aren't all generally racing all together, although we mostly have raced together at some point uh, during our lives. Uh, and that's also where I met Ben, who does um, the Failcast F1 with me. Uh, we met in a league called GPVWC back in 2008 into 2009 uh, and have been chums ever since. So, yeah, I recommend it. And the reason why I wanted to put this one in this is uh, New Year, New Me. More. Um, whilst we are all stuck, finding a hobby or diving into a new interest is a really great way to expand your friendship circle, but also to discover new things about yourself, um, find people with like-minded thoughts and feelings and interests, but also to kind of then, um, it's like the Venn diagram of you have this common interest, but then you get to discover all of the wonderful things that you may not have come across outside from there um, and the beauty of sim racing is that it's global so i would find um i'd have friends in india uh, japan south uh, africa um, which is a place that i just really have very little knowledge on but i've got a couple of good chums over there um, america canada um, brazil uh, lots of italians and spanish a huge chunk of dutchies <laughs> and even some scandies as well um so yeah plenty of friends uh, and a delight and it's great to hear about all their different cultures and all the different things they get up to and you start to discover all kinds of weird things uh, and form little mini groups and stuff so yeah that's my kind of key thing if you're feeling a bit deflated think about something that would pick your interest and get in for a hobby because that's a great way to meet new friends 
Okay, I didn't um, put my reply for that one because it was just me going sim racing. Uh, but I will put a reply on screen for this one, which I think is really uh, an interesting dichotomy. Uh, I'm afraid I've alienated myself from people for taking a step back to focus on my mental health, which is a good thing, personally, in my opinion. Everything feels different and not in a good way. Um, and that's where the dichotomy comes in. When you focus on your mental health, um, and it's easy to think in hindsight what can be good and what can be bad, it depends on whether you socially thrive or not with your friendships um, or work colleagues or anything like that um, as to where that then sits on your mental health kind of yay or nays. I can't think of like the proper word for it. But the whole thing around this is um, what gives you positive energy, what is a drain, what sucks the life out of you and makes you mentally or emotionally exhausted. And if you've alienated yourself from people who are like energy vampires, that's a great thing because that will improve your mental health because you won't need to deal with that shit anymore. Um, and that's a good thing and it's probably a positive thing to keep them at arm's length and away from you uh, and eventually they'll find other people to suck off of um, who are misses and that will be fine. Um, sometimes though you might have to kind of do a chop of everyone to then understand who you want to re-engage with and get back in again and that might be why you feel different and not in a good way because you might have had to have cut off from people who actually are positive um, coil spins for you um, and so just my advice to that is you'll start to understand and bring back in people who can give you that positive energy and that positive input into life and yeah reach out to them pull them back in again just go do you know what I had I was in a bit of a tailspin I'm feeling a bit happier now I'm better um, let's, let, let's get online and have a chat or if you can meet in person then go for it um, Covid restrictions and all that but um, yeah, I guess the, the only kind of fly in the ointment with that is if they feel a bit um, like, uh, because you might have had to have cut them off and be a bit abrupt with them potentially in the past. Um, if you explain that, if they're a good friend and that they're a good fit for you, they will understand and they will bring you back in. It might be a little bit at arm's length at first, but I'm sure that they will kind of reconnect and pull you back together and you'll have a good friendship or working relationship, however uh, this is transpiring. If they then reciprocate with like a Muh! back again, then that wasn't a good fit for you. And it's better off knowing that now than being further down the line of um, being maybe in an even more difficult place and hoping that they had your back and they wouldn't. So it's best to know that now uh, and move on from it. So, um, yeah, th th there's no hard or fixed rule with mental health. It's very much down to the individual about what gives you that positive or negative coil spin. Um, and sometimes having a complete cleanse is a really good way to try and work out who is actually a good fit. So thumbs up for the stepping back. Um, just now, if you know that you want to re-engage with people, go for it. Let's see what I write. Okay, so I've got firstly well done on the step back. Your mental health trumps uh, or triumphs, sorry, over any friendship or relationship. Uh, and that's true, I firmly believe. Uh, sometimes cutting everyone off can help cleanse who is a positive or negative energy for you in your mind. Maybe helpful to re-engage with the ones you want around to help you. And if it was off before, uh, it may just take some time to get back into the swing of things. Um, you're not, you have to be like proper besties to have like a long cut off from someone and then just re-engage and pick back up where you left off. Very difficult. I've been very fortunate to have that with a few people, um, but it doesn't happen often, it's rare. Um, if they stay aloof though, it's better to know now than to have them not support you when you are in an even darker time. So friendships work both ways. Oh, they do. And if you find yourself as the permanent supporter or the permanent um, antagonist rather than the protagonist, um, you're not doing your friendships justice. Ah -ha -ha! send 
Okay, so the last question, and there's two on here. There's one about coming out and being gay, uh, and this one, which, because um, I've covered gay beforehand, um, this one's just an interesting slant on it, because it's someone who's what well, kind of coming out as a furry, uh, and I dated a furry very briefly. Uh, it was very interesting and educational. So, um, although I don't necessarily have all of the words to say, I think the two kind of run in parallel as, again, it's a new year, new you. Um, I'm going to embrace me and I'm going to be all of me and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and some people kind of go charging in like a ball in a china shop. Um, some people then worry about it's another year where I'm not fully being myself and being true to myself. So that's why I wanted to pick up on one of these questions as like a last one. So... I'm a furry, at least I like the furry fandom a lot. I've always thought that I was a monster and that I tried to stop thinking about it. But I can't help it, I really like it. But I fear seeing so much hate online and knowing that people can hate me because of it. Um, so, a couple of like broad statements that I'll go straight in with is you could have glasses and people will hate you online. You could just be breathing and people could hate you online. It is the beauty and the nature, well, I say beauty, oh, um, it is the nature of humanity, it seems at the moment, in a very polarised world where all caps and having stupid um, clickbaity 280 character or less arguments gets you online publicity. Uh, thank you, algorithms. Um, and so seeing online hate you will have hate no matter who you are and where you are. The flip side of that is that there will always be a place full of love and support and respect and education and community for wherever you are and whatever you decide to identify as. And that can be as a furry, as being gay, as being uh, polyamorous, as being transgender, as being non-binary as, I don't know, deciding that you identify with a very specific kink or a religious thing. This is going around very much around sexuality, um, but it can be for anything. It could be that you identify as really, really loving, um, what's an unpopular opinion? Mass Effect 3. <laughs> it, 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 there'll be a fandom about it. You know there will. Um, and so the whole point of this is that don't, uh, obviously like you don't need to be like plastering it all over a profile if you don't feel comfortable and that's not necessarily how, what your agenda needs to be, but don't feel like you need to bow down to online hate or offline hate for that matter as well. It's real people behind those keyboards, they just get extra bigger bollocks when they think that they're not being seen because they've got a keyboard to whack it out on. And don't be, don't let the hate put you off. People, especially once you've kind of put it out there and you tell people about something, um, Largely, and this is a this is a huge broad statement, and there will be issues where um, people where you come out and identify something, and it isn't a safe space for you to do so. And if you are in that space and you've stumbled across this video, I do have a coming out story video on my channel, um, and like tips and advice for if you're doing so, um, and maybe how I'd have done it slightly differently. Um, although mine has been largely trouble free, I must say. Um, the what what was I trying to say? I've lost my thread. Da, 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 da. When you um, when you do something like this, um, people are so busy worrying about themselves, and this is especially this is slightly more around kink and communities and that kind of stuff. People are so worried about their own issue or their own fetish or their own inner um, like kinks and needs and wants and feels, they're not thinking, what? how can I project and be awkward on you? And if they do, it's for such a split second before they become self-conscious themselves. Um, and what you'll find is that people who are comfortable in their sexuality or their orientation or their gender or um, anything, 
they will embrace and welcome everyone with open arms because they understand the path that they had to get to to be comfortable with that so it's not that that they're dealing with and generally again a general broad statement but people who are going to be like Ugh, are generally so there'll be an uncomfortableness somewhere elsewhere where they don't feel as comfortable in themselves and there might be an element of jealousy there might be an element of fear because of lack of education um and, and misunderstanding because and furry is a really good one actually um like <laughs> there's a certain kind of online narrative about what furries are up to and what they do um and it's not the case because everyone's kind of drilled down to that very specific stereotype and there's all kinds of colors creeds and shades of everything everywhere under every banner and so um don't worry about the online hype what i would say is that if you're going to come out as a furry or come out as an anything do have some preparation steps in place especially if you feel that you aren't in a safe space to do so uh, and do it incrementally work out where your kind of trusted people are and who you think will be on your side um, if you're going to do this online um, but you don't want your offline world to know it would be worthwhile making sure that you kind of keep those two worlds as separate as possible where possible until you are comfortable that you want to if you ever do want to kind of make the offline and online worlds kind of combine um yeah and and just do it gradually and increase that circle increase it so that you then don't feel self-conscious because i'm i'm having those two kind of camps separate is really really handy to start with because you're making those baby steps to making the change and making something bigger i think it's very it can become so overwhelming to just be like today i am a furry and like run out and be like hey everyone look at me i suck on a cock um here's my here's my yif pose it's just just yeah it's, it's a lot to take in. So if you can kind of do it separately to begin with where you're most comfortable and then I think it becomes a stage where you start to feel like you're almost lying to yourself and although it kind of splits it out and you're kind of having to do like round two, the sequel of going around and doing the same thing again, it's much more manageable because you've already got a lived experience of having done it. So um, yeah, that's my kind of advice to that. Ignore the online hate. There's hate for everything, but there's love for it too and be comfortable understanding or exploring what it is that you want to be. Um, yeah, I see what I write. So I've put, if you can breathe, there will be an online hate for it or a community, sadly. Uh, but where there is community, there is also support, friendship, fun, love and trust. There's a place for everyone. Starting online, which is a good place. Uh, sorry, starting online is a good place to understand what floats your boat specifically. And if it's been a furry, embrace it. And if you want to bring that offline, you'll have picked up tips and experience on how to navigate those conversations along the way. Education and being yourself is key. You'll break down the stereotype with ease within a few minutes. Enjoy and good luck. Send. Go on, send it, mate. Okay, so that was it for this New Year episode. The theme was all about embracing a change, trying new things, but doing it in an incremental step-by-step -step process so that you can kind of feel that you're in control of your destiny when in the world feels so out of control and out of our hands. Um, I wish you all a fantastic year ahead. Plenty of stuff going on uh, on this channel in general and across all of my other projects, but uh, generally, a warm hug and uh, a chin chin glass from me. I would raise a glass, but I've already drunk it whilst <laughs> writing and reading all of these letters. So, glug glug. Have a good one. Take care. Bye bye. <laughs> Such an alcoholic. <laughs>